Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The acrylic removable appliance is one of the most useful clinical tools in orthodontics. It may be used as a retainer to hold teeth in a corrected position after orthodontic treatment, or it may be used to perform minor tooth movement through the use of auxiliary springs. Also, upper arch removable appliances may serve as bite planes to control the vertical alveolar growth displacement of teeth. There are three main types of wires used in removable acrylic appliances. Clasps, labial wires, and springs. One of the most commonly used clasps is the Adams clasp. The clasp is named after the man who designed it, a Dr. Adams. This clasp gains its retention from two small loops that engage the buccal proximal cervical aspect of the tooth. Usually there is an undercut area in this region of the buccal surface of a posterior tooth. The wire crosses the occlusal surface in the groove between the marginal ridges of the adjacent teeth. The wire then sweeps down into the palatal area where, is it, where it is embedded in acrylic. To bend an Adams clasp, the first step is to prepare the work model. You must remove about a half a millimeter of the free gingival margin at the buccal proximal aspect, as I'm doing here. It's been done on this work model. Not very much plaster is removed, just enough to allow the loop to engage the undercut area. Adams clasps are made from 0 0.025 diameter stainless steel round wire, and they're bent with 139 bird beak pliers. The first step is to bend a small loop, very small loop, in the wire. The loop has as its outside dimensions one and a half to two millimeters. Placing the beaks on the inside of the loop, a right angle bend is made. And then the loop is turned to be at 30 to 45 degrees to this straight portion of the wire. The wire is tried on the work model, and the small loop is placed in the prepared spot on the work model. You mark the wire at the point where the next small loop will start. The second right angle bend is made right at that point in the same plane of space as the other loop. And the second loop is completed so that it is also at a 30 to 45 degree angle to this crossbar portion of the wire. The wire is tried back on the work model, and the small loops should engage the prepared undercut areas on the buccal surface of the teeth. Only the ends of the loops touch the tooth. The crossbar portion, the straight portion between the two loops, is about a half a millimeter away from the buccal surface of the tooth. 
Now, some problems may arise at this point in the fabrication of an Adams clasp. If you have bent the loops too far apart, such as in this Adams clasp here, the second loop will be placed too far to the distal and will not engage that prepared undercut area. To correct that, you can place a small curvature in this crossbar portion of the Adams clasp, as I'm doing here. And in this way, bring those loops into contact with the undercut area. If you have bent the loops too close together, as in this Adams clasp, the only solution is to start over, prepare another wire. After this segment of the Adams clasp is bent the way you'd like to have it, the next step is to place the plier into the loop portion again and begin to sweep the wire towards the occlusal crossing. This is done with a series of small bends, always placing the wire back in the pliers in the same spot, usually. And keep bending the wire until it is adapted through the marginal ridges of those two adjacent teeth there. Now, when the wire is bent to this point, sometimes it will interfere on the opposite side of the model, right there, and it's best to cut the wire off. Now, this wire has been adapted to fit right between the marginal ridges of these two teeth. You mark the wire and begin to sweep the wire down into the palatal portion of the work model with a series of small bends, sliding the wire along the plier. The end of the wire that's down in the pallet has a small hook or a small loop bent into it to serve as retention in the acrylic for the clasp. The distal aspect of the spring is bent in exactly the same manner, adapting it through the proximal regions, closely adapted to the marginal ridges of the teeth, and the final product looks like this. The criteria for a good Adams clasp, first, the loops must be in tight contact with the tooth in the undercut areas to ensure proper clasp action. Second, the wire must be closely adapted between the marginal ridges as it crosses the occlusion. And lastly, the wire must be one millimeter off the palatal tissues. The circumferential clasp is another commonly used clasp for removable appliances. It is used most often to clasp the most distal tooth in a dental arch or to clasp a tooth with an adjacent edentulous space. The circumferential clasp gains its retention from frictional contact with the buccal surface and also from engagement of undercut areas that are gingival to the labial bulge of 
posterior teeth. Usually, this clasp is made from round stainless steel wire that is 0 0.030 inches in diameter or larger. To bend a circumferential clasp, the first step is to make a pencil outline on the work model. The circumferential clasp courses right along the free gingival margin of the tooth, passes through the proximal area and down onto the palatal portion. The first step in bending the wire is to make a small curve in the wire. This is tried on the work model so that it adapts right along the free gingival margin of the tooth. The wire is marked at the spot where you want the next bend to start. And the wire is bent through the proximal contact area with a series of small bends so that you can control the shape of the wire. When you have it adapted through the proximal area the way you'd like to have it, you mark the wire at the spot where you want it to begin to sweep down onto the palatal portion. After each bend, you try the wire back on the work model to make sure that your last bend was correctly placed. There. Now, again, another mark is made on the wire at the point where you'd like to have it sweep further down into the palatal area, right there. The end of the wire is formed in the shape of a hook for retention in the acrylic. The excess wire is cut off and the circumferential clasp has then been formed. The criteria for a good circumferential clasp are, first, it must engage the undercut area on the buccal surface of the tooth being clasped. Second, it is closely adapted to the free gingival margin along its entire course. And third, it is adapted to be one millimeter off the palatal tissues. The Holly labial wire is used in almost all removable orthodontic appliances because it may serve either as a large clasp to increase the retention of the appliance in the mouth or as a spring that can be used to tip incisor teeth to the lingual. The labial wire is referred to as the Holly labial wire after the man who first designed this wire. To bend a labial wire, the first step is to prepare the work model by trimming off the anterior portion of the base to allow an easier access to the labial surfaces of the teeth from all sides. A pencil outline is marked on the work model along the course that you'd like the wire to follow. The wire lies in the middle one-third 
of the labial surfaces of the incisor teeth. The loops start at a, the exact middle of the cuspid teeth, mesiodistally, and the loops are four to six millimeters in width, outside dimension, and are usually five to seven millimeters high from the labial wire to the top of the loop. Now variations in the size of this loop depend on the size of the teeth in the dental arch and the size of the dental arch itself. And also, sometimes these loops are made slightly large if the labial wire is to serve as a spring to perform a lot of tooth movement and will undergo a lot of adjustment. Most often, the labial wire is constructed to be a series of smooth, sweeping curves contacting all of the incisor teeth in the cuspids. It is adapted usually to touch as many teeth as possible without incorporating sharp bends into the wire. This is the easiest way to form a labial wire and the most generally useful design for this wire clinically. There are some variations in the design of labial wires. Uh, if a labial wire is to serve only as a clasp or to serve only as a retainer to hold teeth in their corrected positions after orthodontic tooth movement, the wire is closely adapted to the labial surface of all of the incisor teeth and the cuspids, as shown here. If the labial wire is to be used to tip teeth, such as in this case, it's to be used to tip this tooth right here to the lingual, the wire contacts only the tooth to be tipped and is left out of contact with the other incisor teeth. By closing this adjustment loop, lingual pressure is applied to this one protrusive incisor and it can be moved back into line with the other incisor teeth. To bend a labial wire, the first step is to adapt a wire to the labial surface of the incisor teeth right along the pencil outline. I've done this in advance because this can be a lengthy procedure. After the wire has been adapted to the labial surfaces of the teeth, you mark the wire at the spot where the pencil outline indicates that the loop should begin. A right angle bend is placed in the wire at that point. And the wire is tried back on the work model. If you have bent the wire along your pencil outline the way you'd like it to be, you mark the wire at the point where the curve in the loop will start. And proceed to bend the loop in the wire. Now at this point, you can run into some problems. Here, the loop has been bent at too much of an angle, and it is contacting the tissues 
right at this point there. An adjustment in the orientation of the loop is necessary. This may be done by grasping the loop as a whole in the flat base portion of the wire or the plier and applying a force to the labial portion of the wire to orient the loop in a more desirable position as has been done there. When the loop is properly formed, the next step is to begin the adaptation of the loop towards the point where it crosses the occlusion, this portion of the wire right there. The wire is bent in a sweeping manner with a series of small bends towards the palatal. and tried back on the model very often to be sure that you've placed the bends in the right spot. Now, the wire has been bent now to the point where it is contacting the cuspid. It leaves contact with the cuspid right at the middle of the tooth, mesiodistally. The loop is off of the tissues, out of contact with the tissues, all the way around until this point right here the proximal margin. By holding the loop onto the model with your thumb and holding the labial wire in the proper position with your other hand like this, you can mark the spot where the wire will cross the occlusion by simply bending it. Now this will not make the complete bend through the occlusion, but it will at least mark the spot where the bend should be made. You then place the wire in the pliers and complete the bend. The excess wire in the palatal region will be cut off. And you try the wire back on your model. And the wire has been closely adapted as it crosses the occlusion. The wire is marked and bent in a continuous curve to adapt it to the palatal tissues to be one millimeter off the palatal tissues and a small hook is bent into the end of the palatal portion to ensure retention in the acrylic. The loop on the other side is bent in exactly the same manner, using exactly the same procedures. Here is a wire where the opposite side loop has been bent also. The criteria for a good labial wire are, first, the wire must contact the middle one-third of the labial surface of the incisor teeth. Secondly, the loops must be half the width of the cuspid, and they must be one millimeter off the gingival tissues. The wire must be closely adapted to the work model as it crosses the occlusion. And lastly, the wire must be one millimeter off the palatal 
tissues. Tooth movement is performed most often with finger springs in acrylic removable appliances. Here, a finger spring has been constructed to place a distal tipping force on this first permanent molar. With the acrylic removed, the spring looks like this. This portion of the finger spring is known as the spring arm, and it contacts the mesial surface of this molar tooth. This is called the helix, and it's a coil in the wire. If this spring is activated or bent to a different shape, as this one has been, and then sprung back into contact with the mesial surface of the molar when the appliance is inserted in the mouth, a distal tipping force is then applied to that molar tooth. The clinical tooth moving effect of a spring like this is dependent upon several factors. The most important of these factors uh, is wire size used and spring configuration. Regarding wire size for springs, the larger the wire used, the greater the force will be for a constant amount of activation of a spring. As an example, here are two springs of the same shape that have been opened or deflected 10 millimeters. The larger size spring of 036 wire diameter will apply more force than the smaller size spring of 0 0.022 diameter wire with the same 10 millimeter activation. Usually wires that are 0 0.025 up to 0 0.036 inches in diameter are used for finger springs to move posterior teeth. For anterior teeth, wires in the 0 0.016 to 0 0.025 diameter range are used. The multi-rooted posterior teeth usually require higher levels of force to produce tooth movement. Incisors, on the other hand, with smaller root structures usually need less force to bring about effective clinical tooth movement. Spring configuration can affect the clinical action of a spring. The length of the spring arm affects the range of tooth movement possible from a finger spring. If the spring arm is short, the effective range of the spring will also be short. As an example, the spring arm here is so short that only a one millimeter range of activation or range of tooth movement is possible to be produced by this finger spring. With a longer spring arm, a greater range of tooth movement from the spring is possible. Here in this drawing, four millimeters of effective tooth movement range is possible with the longer spring arm. The most important factor in spring design is the position of the helix relative to the tooth being moved. Ideally, the helix or the origin of the spring arm should be positioned halfway along the line of desired tooth movement. Here in this example, we would like to move the tooth from the solid line position to the dotted line position. The line of desired tooth movement is represented by this green arrow. To produce this line of tooth movement, the helix must be positioned so that a line drawn from a point on the activated position of the spring 
to the same point on the deactivated position of the spring would coincide exactly with the line of desired tooth movement. By varying the position of the helix, it is possible to produce a more labial direction of spring force or a more lingual direction of tooth movement force. <laughs> to bend a finger spring, the first step is to mark the pencil outline on the model. In marking this outline, be sure that the spring arm is sufficiently long and that the helix is positioned to produce the tooth movement along the line of desired tooth movement. The palatal helix is bent first by pushing the wire around the round beak of the 139 pliers. The helix that is formed is usually about four millimeters in diameter. The spring arm portion of the spring is formed to lie to the gingival. The palatal portion, the portion that's embedded in acrylic, is more to the occlusal. I'm going to form the palatal portion of the wire at this time to prevent its interference with the adaptation of the spring arm. You hold the helix in the proper position on the work model and mark the spot where you want the wire to begin sweeping up towards its contact with the mesial surface of that molar tooth. And with a series of small bends, the wire is shaped to adapt to the model along the pencil outline. As the spring passes through the proximal region, it's marked again, and the wire is adapted around to the buccal surface of the molar tooth, again with a series of small bends. When the wire is adapted around to the buckle, a small loop may be bent at the end of the wire to prevent injury to the oral tissues. The alternative to bending this small loop at the end of the finger spring is to place a small piece of solder I'm going to tighten this helix a bit so that it follows along the pencil outline on the palatal portion a little more accurately. The final step in the forming of this wire would be the bending of a small hook in this portion of the wire for retention in acrylic.
the finger spring has now been formed. The criteria for a good finger spring are first, proper spring design. The wire size, the spring arm length, and the helix position must be correct to produce the amount and direction of tooth movement that you want. Second, the helix should unwind in activation. The natural tendency of the wire to unwind will help the spring action. Lastly, the spring arm is placed to the gingival. In the mouth, the natural tendency of an activated spring is to slide up the side of a tooth up to the occlusal. Positioning the spring arm to the gingival will help to maintain an effective spring contact with the tooth. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.